Okay, uh, good afternoon from Helsinki and welcome to this UNU Wider webinar. My name is Rachel Giselquist. I'm a senior research fellow here, and I'm really pleased to chair this session. Uh, today, our focus is the political economy of development of Bangladesh and how the example of the Bangladesh development story may shed light on ways to overcome vulnerabilities elsewhere. So when Bangladesh gained independence just over 50 years ago in 1971, um, it was a nation emerging from war and it was one of the very poorest countries in the world. And today it's classified as a lower middle income country by the World Bank. It's one of the world's fastest growing economies and it's been praised for its record on poverty reduction, gender equality, nutrition, girls education, maternal and infant mortality. It's faced a number of challenges in its journey um, and we'll consider uh, some of those today and how these lessons might be relevant for some other countries. So in this wider webinar, we will welcome first Dr. K.A.S. Murshid, who is a development economist and the immediate past director, director general at the Bangladesh Institute of Development Studies in Dhaka. He's the author of several books and numerous articles. His core areas of work are agrarian markets and food policy, but he's also published widely in other areas. And in particular, I would spotlight his soon to be published book coming out in June 2022, next month, with Cambridge University Press, entitled The Odds Revisited, The Political Economy of the Development of Bangladesh. And we will hear more uh, in his presentation. And then our second speaker will be Dr. Darlene Mutalemwa, who is a full-time senior lecturer, researcher, and consultant at Muzembe University, Dar es Salaam Campus College, Tanzania, since 2010. For the past 20 years, she's worked extensively in the fields of small and medium enterprise development, development policy, private sector development, uh, diaspora national development, and development aid and HR development. And she will consider in, in her comments uh, lessons for other countries, and I think in particular Tanzania. So without further ado, I'd like to move on to the presentations. Um, our speakers will present one after the other, and they'll talk for, I think, together about 40 minutes, and then we'll have a good 20, 15, 20 minutes for questions. So please do think about your questions, uh, questions that you'd like to raise for our speakers, and feel free to put those questions um, in the chat function or the question box at the bottom of your screen throughout the presentation. And as time permits, I will try to unmute a few of you to ask your questions, but I will also try to ask as many of your questions um, as I can. So let's turn over uh, to Murshid, please. You have the floor. Thank, thank you, Rachel. And uh, thank you for the introduction. And uh, uh, I should also thank uh, Wider and its director, Professor Kunhalsen, for uh, inviting me to make this presentation. It's always, of course, a pleasure for me to talk about Bangladesh. And uh, I value this opportunity to do this, particularly before this audience. Now, <clears throat> as you know that uh, Bangladesh has attracted a, a bit of attention in recent years for a number of reasons. I think uh, uh, international donor agencies generally have been kind of relieved that the bad news from Bangladesh appear to have now diminished and we're now receiving uh, good news on a number of fronts, particularly in the social sectors. But also because uh, uh, there was an element of surprise. And in fact, people have said that uh, the Bangladesh story is a paradox, deserves to be understood better. And, uh, and some even have said that it is a miracle. Uh, so various epithets have actually been uh, used to describe uh, Bangladesh's development. Uh, but what, in my view, seemed to have been missing was that uh, while there have been uh, fragmented and sectoral analysis of particular aspects of Bangladesh's development, for example, women, gender, the ready-made garments, industry, uh, microcredit, these have received a lot of attention. But what we seem to uh, be missing here 
as a, as a more holistic and a comprehensive treatment of uh, the underlying dynamics that actually led to these outcomes. So that is what I will be trying to allude to in my presentation, but because I only have about 20 minutes, I understand, uh, I will basically be only in a position to share with you an overview of Bangladesh's development processes. And as I do that, I will uh, draw attention to some of the underlying policy dynamics as well. So let me then uh, start. Uh, first of all, you know, this business of, you know, the Bangladesh surprise, the Bangladesh paradox, and the different senses in which the term paradox has been, have been used. Now, I think the element of surprise essentially relates to the fact that uh, Bangladesh, uh, uh, when it uh, emerged out of its semi-colonial condition in 1971, uh, the initial conditions were really, really rough. And apart from the usual uh, uh, stories of you know the destruction and ravages of war, the destruction of infrastructure, uh, the large number of refugees that needed to be resettled and rehabilitated, the internally displaced persons, large numbers of casualties. These were the usual sort of post-war conflict uh, uh, situation scenario. But even to, apart from that, the condition of Bangladesh was that it was an extremely poor country to start with. You know, some 80% of the people were un, un, below the poverty line. And uh, the economy was in a way very simple, it was largely dominated by agriculture and within agriculture, rice had dominated everything else. And so the entire economy was actually dependent on monsoon agriculture. So it basically meant that uh, the, the, the welfare uh, year to year and season to season of its people depended on the rains and both how much as well as how little. So that was basically the situation. The level of industrialization was very low, maybe about 5%. So these were the initial conditions. And on top of that, you've had severe political instability, assassination of the founding father, uh, and, and ideological conflict, uh, and the, the, the global situation was also hostile. So all these together, uh, I think, created a condition in which the expectation for Bangladesh all around was extremely negative. And therefore, when Bangladesh actually began to overcome these, people began to be surprised or felt that, well, how could this happen? Because you know we have such widespread poverty and such uh, poor governance and high level of corruption low public uh, expenditures. So how were these outcomes then possible? So this was then labeled as a surprise or a paradox or a miracle. So let me start by trying to conceptualize uh, the development dynamics underlying Bangladesh's development. Now the, the most important thing I would say was, uh, that the Malthusian challenge that Bangladesh faced with regard to food and population, because population growth rate was over 3%. And productivity in agriculture and food was very, very low. And there was obviously these Malthusian fears that fed into Bangladesh's policy making and generally shared by everybody else. So that was actually the uh, first area that the government, supported by the donors, uh, set out to do something about. And this figures very prominently in the first five-year plan, for example. So this was actually the major challenge. And I think Bangladesh's success with the Green Revolution, first of all, and secondly, uh, its ability uh, to oversee a rapid fertility decline. These were the two factors that created or created the enabling conditions upon which everything else could then uh, be, could follow. So these were the basic 
to foundations. Now, I should mention that you know these were not easy challenges to address. The Green Revolution took 30, 30 years or so to, to actually uh, bring about. And it was a, a, a very hard struggle. It was very hard to get there. And there were many mistakes made, but in the end, once the incentives were set in, set in properly, once the policies were uh, fine-tuned, uh, it took off. With fertility decline, uh, again, there was a, a bit of a paradox there as well, because the conventional wisdom was that in a, in a country which was traditional, very poor, low levels of literacy, uh, 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 the, the impact of tradition, an adverse power structure, uh, exploitation by large farmers and you know, semi-feudal elements, Islam and tradition, all these together meant, and, 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 the, and the low status of women meant that you know, uh, the adoption of population control te technology would be extremely poor. Uh, but once this technology was made available, uh, I think in, in women poor, whether rural or urban, poor or rich, in, irrespective of class or religion, you know, came forward and adopted adopted family control policies or te techniques uh, spontaneously. And this kind of caused a lot of consternation amongst development researchers and policymakers. But that was a good thing. So these were the two basic foundations upon which you know, the Bangladeshi economy was able to then move forward. Now, in parallel, other developments emerged. Uh, although the Green Revolution and fertility, these were led, you know, these strategies were led by the government and paid very generously, I must say, by the donors, there are other developments that occurred either by chance or by what I would say uh, was the action of actor heroes or champions. In fact, you know, you, you could think of them as uh, the, the phrase that Piketty used as switching points where, you know, individual champions could change outcomes. So, for example, in the, in the, in the uh, labor exports opportunities that opened up in the late 70s, early 80s, it, you know, this happened spontaneously and was entirely private sector led. Uh, and, you know, the, the role of the government came much later, which was a, a, a supportive role. And, but basically it was driven by the private sector. Now the RMG industry, I mean, that too has, uh, has emerged as a result of private sector initiative by chance occurrences in the global environment, but deeply supported by the government. So, but these two outcomes, you know, the success with labor exports and remittances and success with cheap labor exports in the form of ready-made garments. These were two additional pillars of Bangladesh's development because what it did was it altered the availability of foreign exchange and foreign resource, reserves uh, for the Bangladesh economy, which was of course something that uh, Bangladesh was direly in need of. So these were basically the, the initial uh, impetus uh, in terms of development dynamics in the uh, late 70s, 80s, up to the 90s. Another element uh, that I, one should mention is the, pharma, the development of the pharmaceutical industry. Again, this was the, uh, the product of uh, a champion uh, in the form of a, an NGO leader who was able to persuade the then government to enact the national drug policy, which allowed Bangladeshi firms to copy generic drugs uh, for the home market. And although this was stiffly resisted by the multinational pharmaceuticals in the country at the time, uh, this was uh, followed through, the law was enacted, and this enabled the, the, the rather uh, formative stages of the Bangladesh's pharmaceutical industry to really uh, expand and grow very, very quickly. So again, something that was very unexpected, but occurred by chance and through individual action, later on supported by the government. 
So, so there are various kinds of policy dynamics that one can uh, detect here already. Now, the, what the Green Revolution also did was because of its role in the overall economy, it not only had an impact on the microeconomy at the household level in terms of incomes, consumption, savings, uh, nutrition, uh, but also the macroeconomy because it had macroeconomic Im impacts uh, on in inflation, on uh, uh, foreign exchange reserves. At the same time, it allowed the rural non-farm sector to grow rapidly. And in fact, uh, one of the latest successes of Bangladesh has been uh, the growth of the rural non-farm economy, especially in aquaculture, which has been designated as a blue revolution, and in poultry. So these are the spin-offs from the basic uh, foundational developments that one can think of immediately. Now, coming back to the, the social sector outcomes, uh, I took a bit of time to come to but although the social sector outcomes have been the most commented upon internationally, uh, uh, these other outcomes come in a package. I think these, have, these are the dynamics have to actually be viewed uh, uh, together to understand what uh, the overall outcomes have been. Now, the social outcomes were generated or engendered by uh, NGOs. And again, once again, individual actor champions uh, were the, the key driving elements here. Later on, uh, gen again, generously uh, supported by donor engagement and by the state. But I think in the 80s, 70s, 80s, 90s, there was a, a historical moment, a historical opportunity where the, the NGO movement could actually find space to expand and develop and innovate, uh, which may not always, may not be easy for other countries to replicate because I think at that time, the state was weak, at least in the rural areas and the NGOs were active in the rural areas. There was very little else going on there. And therefore I think the state either deliberately or implicitly allowed the space to be contained by NGOs, at least for a, for a few decades. Now, the mediating roles, of course, uh, policy, there were all kinds of policies that needed uh, to support all these outcomes. And these policies were, uh, in some cases, initiated by the government, but in most cases, I think that once the developments were uh, in almost in evidence or championed by powerful individual champions and actors, the government then came along and said, okay, we will support this. And I, I think this really has been the, the story in Bangladesh. The, the role of the market is of course, extremely important. Now, uh, to start with, I think Bangladesh was lucky that its agrarian markets actually worked well, even in the earliest times. The markets worked efficiently, worked well, but of course, over time, uh, as the infrastructure improved, uh, the advent of yeah, better rural roads, mobile phones, financial technology, these markets became even much more efficient uh, and also allowed the development of entrepreneurship. Now, the entrepreneurship story is complicated. Bangladesh had a very, very small entrepreneurial class. Basically, it was a mercantile class. But a new entrepreneurial class has emerged in over the 30 or 40 years of Bangladesh. This again, I think, was an extremely significant outcome which has not really been studied very much. I have a chapter of this on the book. I don't think I'll have time to talk about this in this presentation. But with hindsight, what we can see is we can identify obviously synergies, linkages, complementarities, all of which across sectors and across cross-cutting uh, uh, outcomes, all of these combined to development, uh, to, uh, uh, to deliver excellent development outcomes. Now, I will not, I've already talked about the initial conditions, and so I will not talk very much about that right now. Uh, but I would like to mention uh, one particular element that I've talked about space. Now, I think uh, this, is, this is again not really discussed very much in the literature, uh, but Bangladesh, I think, has been in a unique position that after 1947, 
when it became free of uh, its colonial masters and became an independent country as part of Pakistan. One thing that happened was at with one stroke, it was able to get rid of the feudal zamindari system uh, that dominated Bangladesh's agriculture. Now, so, uh, and mainly because most of the zamindars, the feudal landlords were Hindu, and with the, with the, with the emergence of uh, uh, Pakistan, East Pakistan for Bangladesh at that, at that time, most Hindus left the country. So this vacuum was created, and this basically left the rural economy free of a feudal constraint. And if we look back again to 1971, when Bangladesh was able to free itself from semi-colonial rule, again, new spaces were created because the power structure was non-indigenous. And also the mercantile and trading sectors and the business sectors were dominated by non-indigenous people. And they also left. And this created, I think, space for an indigenous capitalist sector to develop in Bangladesh. I'm, this, I'm, I'm sure this may be a little controversial, but the fact is that, of course, this is not the only way you can create space. Space can be created through policies, through all kinds of mechanisms. But in Bangladesh's case, uh, this, I think, is a basic precondition that we found. And I think Bangladesh benefited from that. Now, so what I will do now, I don't know how much more time I have. Let me just check. Uh, probably not about five or 10 minutes. Just about so, um, seven minutes or so. Seven minutes. So what I will try to do quickly, very, very quickly, is to provide a, a broad overview of Bangladesh's development outcomes. So Bangladesh became a lower middle income country uh, in uh, 2015, I think, or 14. Uh, and it was on track to graduate out of LDCs by 2024, but this has now been deferred because of COVID. Now the GDP per capita uh, in 2020 was $1,626 in 2015 prices. It was $463 in 1972, again in constant 2015 prices. So this is about four times uh, the 72 level, but of course in nominal terms, this is much more from $94 to about around $2,000 today. Now, Bangladesh has set itself very ambitious targets to become an upper middle income country by 2031 and a high income country by 2041. Very ambitious targets, uh, but one never knows Bangladesh is a miracle country after all. Uh, okay, the growth. Now, the, I think one of the main char characteristics of the growth process uh, is a stability. One sees in that, you know, through, except for the early years, when you see these wide fluctuations in growth, the growth has been stable, moderate, even high. And this, I think, is a characteristic that you don't always find in many developing countries. But there, now, so apart from stability, this growth was widely distributed. It trickled down. It, uh, it reduced poverty. It was perhaps the main factor underlying poverty uh, reduction. And also it helped to address uh, nutrition. So in a way, Bangladesh's growth was widely shared. I think that's really the main story here. Now, other macro indicators, you know, the savings rate arose from a very low level to about 25%. Uh, the national savings rose to, rose to around 35, 36 percent from 8 percent in 1980. Investment has grown enormously from about 10 percent to over 32 percent. So uh, public investment similarly in the initial years was higher than private, but now the private investment has become much larger. So basically it's, it's what you would expect in a, in a development process where the savings rate goes up and, and the investment takes off led by the private sector. Now, so macroeconomic stability was in terms of the balance of payments, the reserves became comfortable, the debt to GDP ratio was always kept under control, uh, about under 15% for most of the 50 years. Uh, the savings investment rates were impressive. And of course, the overwhelming aid dependence that we had seen in earlier years come down. The main weakness, I think, was the tax GDP ratio 
and the high uh, NPL in the banking sector, the, the uh, outstanding loans in the banking sector, not the non-performing loans. These are the two major issues that continue to uh, be problematic for the country. The sectoral shares very quickly, we see the rapid decline in agriculture from 60% in 1972 to about 13% today. You see the ra rapid rise in industry from 6% to 31%. Services have grown, but not as fast. And for industry, it was mainly RMG, the ready-made garments, followed by textiles, but there are other uh, industrial sectors that are now emerging. For agriculture, it was not just rice, it, it has now also been uh, fish and poultry and so on and so forth. And services sector, instead of being just low, low uh, le levels of services and low productivity services, it has now tended to become much higher level. The, the achievements in, in, the, in, in demographic areas like the fertility rate we've mentioned, the, the infant mortality rate, the mortality, maternal mortality rate, these guys basically give you a very quick view of how rapidly these things have improved. Nutrition, again, the data is a bit patchy, but from whatever data that we do have, we, we do see an incred incredible performance in the nutritional sector, particularly nutritional status of children and also women. And the main element underlying this has been income growth, as opposed to direct nutri nutritional interventions. Again, the school enrollment, we, I think there's a lot of familiarity with this. Basically, the story here is that female uh, enrollment at all levels have increased dramatically. For the primary sector, it is outstripped uh, uh, the, the male enrollment. And similarly so for the secondary sector, the tertiary sector, there is still lagging behind. So one would expect the gender outcomes to be impressive, and that is that is what it was. I don't have really any, any more time left, uh, so I'm just going to go and uh, talk, okay, a little bit about poverty. I've said that much of the poverty uh, uh, decline can be attributed to growth, but also there was a lot of experimentation in terms of anti-poverty uh, measures uh, and uh, methods uh, led by NGOs, participated by the government. And I think it's a combination of both growth and direct poverty intervention uh, uh, programs. Inequality, inequality has been a problem and it has really become very high today from a base level of 0.36 in terms of Gini to around 0.5 today. But uh, the corresponding consumption Gini remains stable and it has not really increased very much. So this is a contradiction. We can talk about why this has been the case during the discussion. So summing up, I think, you know, Bangladesh's transformation, we can, we can say that it has been a complex interplay of markets, micro institutions, grassroots institutions that were created by the NGOs, uh, technology, policies and innovations. And, and these were driven by the state, in some cases by NGOs, supported by the donors and the private sector played a very important role. And, you know, but for, and, and the sectoral stories differ widely from one another. So it's very difficult to generalize or use one broad model or, uh, our, uh, our team to explain all this. I have, I have avoided discussing things like democracy and governance. Uh, we can talk about it uh, later if there is time. So let me conclude at this point. Thank you, Mr. Chen. Thank you very much. I'm gonna turn directly over to our discussant now. Darlene, please, you have the floor. Yes. Um, and I've gotten a few questions already, but please, please continue to send questions and we'll try to get to as many of them as we can. All right. Um, so um, thank you so much, um, Rachel and Mushi. Uh, Mushi, your presentation was just full of so much insight. 
So uh, we're looking forward to hearing uh, the questions from the audience. Um, I have a really interesting presentation because uh, from what Mushi has covered, I think there are so many lessons that we can learn from um, Bangladesh. So um, as a discussant, um, my role is really to think of the relevance of the Bangladesh experience. And I only have 10 minutes, which is really unfair for Tanzania and what um, Tanzanian policymakers need to do for Tanzania to graduate. Um, in my humble opinion, I think the Bangladesh experience um, highlights four core lessons for Tanzania. Um, I think lesson number one is the Bangladesh story reminds us that um, empowering women is really essential to ending extreme poverty. Um, countries can never really reach the full economic um, potential if women are not fully participating. participating sorry. Uh, Bangladesh, I think, is a story of progress by empowering people, um, I think, especially women. So over the past several decades, um, Tanzania has made significant, significant progress in increasing women's access to education, um, entrepreneurship, um, wage employment, and women's economic empowerment um, played a major role in the country's transition from low income to lower middle income status on July 1st, 2020. Um, there exist still to date issues that constrain women's ability to contribute to Tanzania's national development. So some of the solutions towards these constraints include, for example, um, the government can promote women's economic empowerment by providing um, tailored, business and life skills training to female entrepreneurs who are uh, operating in many sectors uh, of the economy. Um, I also think that stepping up efforts to end child labor will also help and also to also lower school dropout rates and also provide childcare support, which are really vital to really expand uh, women's participation in the workforce. I would also suggest that uh, conditional cash transfer programs can also be um, an effective strategy for perhaps keeping female students enrolled in school and also reduce um, the fertility rates among adolescents. Land reforms are also recommended because they really need to address the quality of service delivery and really boost female land ownership. Um, the authorities, for example, can strengthen women lands rights by offering land titling subsidies to lower income households and also by providing incentive to encourage um, spouses to co-title. Um, to address the gender gap in agricultural productivity, I think policymakers should focus on expanding women's access to male household labor and also increasing um, women's use of agricultural inputs and also encouraging women to adopt new digital technologies. And then I think also uh, behavioral interventions can um, also promote financial inclusion among women and also strengthen their capacity to manage both their personal and business finances. Um, lesson number two, I think is, it's also closely linked to lesson number one. Uh, the Bangladesh story reminds us that food security, nutritional balance, employment generation and poverty alleviation are closely linked to the development of the agriculture sector. The Bangladesh success is well rooted in the agricultural sector. So for Tanzania, agriculture um, accounts for the largest share of employment. Uh, the greater proportion of women than men work in agriculture. They both contribute substantially to both commercial and subsistence agriculture, including livestock and fishing. Women and girls, the so-called unpaid family helpers, are also responsible for food preparation, fetching water, and also gathering firewood. Um, and they are employed in the agriculture sector. So to really make also nutrition security a reality in Tanzania, it's really important, I think, to also intensify nutritional awareness advocacy training and also educational programs that really maximize the consumption of nutritious foods from both own production and also market purchases. Malnutrition in Tanzania is mostly um, affecting women of reproductive age and also young children. So the fact that we have so many women working in the agriculture sector means that if awareness is raised, then women can be empowered. By um, 
effectively and also um, actively engaging with community uh, and local influencers, Bangladesh, I think, was able to garner broader support for more rapid changes in social norms, preferences, and behaviors. I think this can also be done in Tanzania. For example, in Tanzania, Southern Highlands, women rarely give their young children healthy diets. Instead, they rely on grains, notably maize and millet. I think another uh, important recommendation regarding lesson number two is also to really invest more in agricultural research and development, focusing on practices, technologies, and services that are gender, climate, and nutrition sens sensitive. Lesson number three, I think the Bangladesh story also reminds us that it's possible to achieve economic transformation also by uh, focusing on export-led labor-intensive manufacturing activities, given weak formal institutions and also a domestic environment with a high cost of doing business. So the capacity of labor-intensive manufacturing firms, say in textile, leather, and food processing sectors in Tanzania to capture value within global value chains is still limited. I think this really creates an urgent need for Tanzanian manufacturers maybe to shift gears from competing on low labor intensive productivity to competing on higher productivities. So I think for this to really happen, small, medium, uh, micro, large enterprises will need to adopt um, better technologies across um, business functions and also production processes um, to really help firms, especially SMEs, which are really the backbone of the Tanzanian economy, to borrow for their technology needs easily. I think a stronger financial sector will be needed and also continuing with regulatory reforms to really reduce the cost of doing business is also vital. The Tanzanian government and her development partners will also need to continue supporting education and also upskilling and also helping firms to have access to advisory services and also making firms be aware of available technologies. And, and I also think that it's very important to also support quality um, connectivity to international markets. And then the last lesson, I think the Bangladesh story reminds us that it's really important to maintain a concerted national commitment to issues and also sustaining it across successive administration, regardless of political party. So during the leadership of President John Magufuli, President John Magufuli from 2015 to 2021, anti-corruption efforts inspired the adoring Twitter hashtag, what would Magfully do? He was also praised for encouraging infrastructure projects and also improving public service delivery. However, there were attacks on the political opposition, civil society, businesses in the country, international businesses, regional businesses, and also laws were also passed to impede information sharing. So President Samia Sulu Hassan, Tanzania's first female head of state, with a slogan, Kazi and Delay, loosely translated as the work must continue, has recognized that the lack of consistency creates uncertainty for all stakeholders. So managing the economy, stability, and policy consistency is especially important. It's really imperative to improve Tanzania's image. So Kazi Iandele. So to conclude this presentation, um, development paths are neither linear nor static and involve uh, complex processes. Um, there's really no definite recipe or standard prescription. I think Tanzania can really benefit from the Bangladesh story lessons that are both positive and negative while designing really policies that really reflect her particular conditions. So thank you so much for listening to me. Excellent, thank you so much, Darlene.
Um, Marcia, do, would you like to respond before we, we take broader questions? Let, let's take a few more questions. Okay. Um, so I have a number of questions piling up here and please continue to send your questions. Um, the first set, the first question uh, was uh, by an anonymous um, person writing in, um, actually two questions here and they've, the, the first one comes up a couple of times. So it's a good one to start with. So the first question, um, uh, speaks to sort of the political economy story and the role of democracy and governance that you ended on in your presentation. So question one is with the, the current authoritarian regime and the politicization of all state institutions uh, and uh, no hope for fair elections, do you think that the growth regime will be sustained? Um, how do you negate the role of institutions in stabilizing the economy and growth? And then the second question um, is uh, about the future potential of the country. So when growth is hugely dependent on ready-made garments and remittance, how do you see the future potential mm. of the country? Okay. Okay. Um, first of all, the political economy story. Now, uh, to start with, I think uh, there was a time when uh, Bang the Bangladesh's political economy was uh, based on the so-called large farmer or surplus farmer. And basically it was an agrarian society and therefore the leaders who emerged, the lower middle class, middle class leadership rooted in agriculture and from in the surplus farmer category. And so the political economy was essentially agrarian in nature. Now, today what has happened is with the emergence of a capitalist class in Bangladesh, uh, that this political economy is completely changed. So it is, uh, in a way, much more modern, quote unquote. Uh, it is capitalist in its orientation. And because of the success in exports with the ready made garments, it has uh, become familiar with world markets and opportunities in the world market. And, and therefore, uh, but of course, the, the, the danger there is with the success of uh, capitalism and the rise of the capitalist class, you have the emergence of crony capital as well, alongside ind independent capital. Now, if this crony capital element, which I fear has become uh, more and more powerful, if this dominates everything else, then you know, the, the trajectory is going to be slightly different from what it has been in the past. Uh, but uh, the good thing in a way is that policies, economic policies will probably be determined by uh, cap the capitalist class and in particular by crony capital, whoever comes to power. So that's one thing. In, the, in terms of democracy and governance, uh, for the last 50 years, it appears not to have mattered or mattered very much. And, and which is why I have actually not, I have deliberately not looked at it because, you know, uh, as a role in Bangladesh's development, uh, it would be very difficult. It would be, I would be hard pressed to find a role for macro, what I would say macro governance and democracy because one of the odds or one of the miracles or paradox of Bangladesh is it, it did develop to, to the extent that it has, despite these negativities, huh? because it, there's no doubt that govern, macro governance was extremely poor, there's high level of corruption. But despite that, these development outcomes were possible. Now, uh, here, what I would like to add is that micro governance, this is why I use the word macro governance rather than micro governance. Microgovernance was a different story. As I said, the space was available for NGOs and donors, basically. It was an unfettered space. And there you have uh, seen the emergence of solid grassroots organizations, which were not inefficient, they're not exploitative. This, this played a very vital role, I think, in the Mangal Tashik, which is why I think institutions are, of course, important. But you know, when we talk of institutions, we tend to generalize, you know, but we need to be a little more specific. What institutions is it that are more important than others? For an agrarian country, 
you know, it's the grassroots rural institutions that would be at the forefront of, you know, receiving and delivering services. So that's, that is the real strength of Bangladesh, even today. Now, but if we look to the future, and this other part of the question was, you know, will this continue to the future? Uh, to the extent that, you know, uh, the reforms with respect to governance and institutions has not really occurred that much, I think there's huge potential to do that. And without that, I don't see how we can move forward to the ambitious goals that have been set. So it would be vital to carry out reforms in you know, governance and institutions, corruption, you know, the, uh, cost of business and so on and so forth. Uh, and, but, and I would even go so far as to say that we need to start in, you know, in, in a few uh, specific areas in, on, on this journey. First, first, uh, first of all, I think the banking system needs to be reformed. The tax collection authority needs to be reformed. Uh, the central bank needs to, it has a lot of power on paper, but actually uh, we see that there have been you know, policy reversals, uh, which are uh, very difficult to explain without reference to crony capital. So these, these things will need to be reformed if this, the future growth trends uh, have to be sustained. The other thing is on the, on the positive side, it is not just an RMG story, it already made garments and textile story anymore. Because what has happened in the meantime is a very large middle class has developed. And so there's a lot of now uh, renewed energy in investment and industrialization based on say consumer durables. Uh, and, you know, and so th that has taken off and, and, and spin off from that has been that there, we already see sufficient energy accumulating in the non-ready-made garments industrial sector, which makes us believe that, you know, industrialization will diversify and then additional areas uh, will be, uh, will, will take place here again. And, and we also see that, you know, exports are, uh, new exports in pharmaceuticals, in bicycles, in, in a number of other fields. So there are lots of kites out there now flying in the air and it all looks very good. But the critical element would be reforms in governance and institutions. Thank you. So we have a, a couple of questions here that are great follow-ups, I think, to, to your, your response on these. And I also wanted to give Darlene a chance to respond as well. But let me let me give these, uh, I'll, I'll repeat the, the couple of questions here, and then I'll, I'll turn to Murshid and then to Darlene to respond. Um, so there's one question here from Wachid on corruption in particular. So you've touched on corruption. Um, and the question is specifically asking about the role of not prosecuting those responsible for uh, non-performing loans, which are choking the financial sector and threatening the stability uh, of the segment. And then there's a, a question here from Jeremiah Olu about, um, well, the question is, do you think that direct adoption of the Bangladesh model can transform an ailing economy like Nigeria? given the, the similar problems uh, with bad governance and corruption. So thoughts, uh, especially around corruption and, and thinking about application elsewhere. So should I respond or Darlene? Um, feel free to start and then maybe we turn to Darlene or if Darlene would like to jump in first, also welcome. <laughs> okay, let me just you say, I, well, you know, I have not really discussed corruption in my book because uh, as I explained why, uh, uh, but the NPL story in Bangladesh is not pretty anymore. I mean, there have been massive defaults and an unwillingness to do very much about it. But, you know, the other thing is, this, the, the problem of loan default is an old problem, but it has now accumulated over the years. And part of the reason for this is that it was a deliberate mechanism to generate primitive accumulation when supporting the private sector or private sector entrepreneurship development. So that really has, and that has been, that was done with donor acquisitions actually. So in the early years, in the 80s and the 90s, you know, there, 
these bank loans were from, especially from state-owned banks were generously made out to people knowing full well that this would never be repaid. But that was a deliberate ploy to generate, I think, an independent entrepreneurial class. Uh, so that's the story. Now, the time has come now. I mean, I, mean, you do, I think that primitive accumulation stage is over. And therefore, it is now time to, you know, wheel it in, and that is not happening. Uh, and out of that reason is that now you have a strong crony, crony class, which makes it difficult to actually do very much about it. And so that's the political economy there. Now, obviously, you know, something has to give for this to change. In terms of direct adoptions, I'm not sure what. Uh, the question really was uh, in terms of, you know, uh, whether, did it mean that, you know, whether state-led development uh, can be useful for Nigeria? I think there is, you know, I don't think there's any uniform or generally applicable story here. What we, as I've said, what we've seen in Bangladesh is that some sectors like agriculture, green revolution, uh, population control, you know, these were, very, very strongly led by the government and supported by donors. There's no question about it. And, but other sectors, other stories relating to Bangladesh's development actually did not originate in the state, but the state came forth and supported, supported the, particularly the RMG sector. Uh, the state support there was extraordinary. So it would be a combination. In Bangladesh's case, it was the state the NGOs, the private sector, and I would say ordinary people responded very well because you know once you have the space, you create the space, you have the incentives. You know the story that people do not respond. This is this is this is not correct. I mean I think time and again we were indoctrinated almost that you know people do not respond to incentives. This is absolutely not true. Given even half an opportunity, we found this you know poor illiterate so-called illiterate women. Uh, you know, so-called steeped in patriarchy and tradition, responding to, you know, family planning, responding to, you know, migration opportunities in the towns and even abroad. And so, you know, so that, to say that people do not respond is absolutely rubbish. So people will respond, you just have to give them half a chance. Um, yeah, I, I totally agree with Murshi. Um, and to Corruption, uh, how do you deal with corruption? I think uh, it depends. Uh, it depends on uh, uh, the leadership. Um, certainly uh, on the president, uh, John Pombe Magufuli, he really took uh, really stern measures, especially with uh, 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 the way that uh, the public sector was delivering services. Um, he would, um, for instance, um, uh, walk in into some of these public institutions at 7.30 to ensure whether or not um, uh, the civil service was at, uh, at work. Um, and also, I think um, the manner in which he also responded um, against the political opposition, uh, against firms that were apparently or allegedly not paying the taxes. We also saw how he handled um, uh, the, the cases of um, certain mining companies. Um, and I think he, he gave a, a, a really, uh, I would say, perhaps negative image. There was a lot of fear. So I think it's also very important when you are addressing corruption, you respect the rule of law and that you have enough information or so-called evidences. So uh, really, it's a really delicate, I would say, um, um, topic. Um, so I think depending on how, you know, the institutions in the countries are uh, made to deal with such issues. On the issue of whether or not Nigeria could adopt the Bangladesh um, model, again, Mushi clearly um, reiterated very well that initial conditions matter. Uh, I also said that every country has its own unique um, story. And the most important thing is to really learn from um, the good, the bad, and the ugly of that country and see whether or not um, we, uh, a country can actually design their own policies based on uh, uh, the country's resources, um, especially labor. 
um, I would also encourage, um, I think this is also an area that I think we, we've also not talk, talked much about, but also the issue of graduate employability. Um, I think the graduates that are leaving universities, for instance, and they want to uh, go and work um, in various sectors of the economy, these are like skilled, they're supposed to be skilled graduates. So it's really important to see whether or not uh, universities are actually producing uh, competent employees that can also contribute um, um, effectively to um, Tanzania's uh, national development. So um, Olu, I think um, Nigeria has a different um, history from Bangladesh and certainly Tanzania. I know, ta I know Nigeria is, um, has been blessed with so many um, natural resources. Um, and in the case of Nigeria, I may, I've made to understood that these resources have actually been um, curses rather than blessing. So uh, initial conditions matters and also the, the capacity and also commitment also go hand in hand. Capacity and commi commitment of the leadership also matter. Thanks. I want, I, sorry, where are you? Okay, just to pick up on the, the last point that you made, I wanted to ask about, um, wanted to shift gears a little bit and ask about, about aid and, and international assistance. Um, and I was struck in, in Mershit's presentation, you know, by several points where you highlighted that, um, that various reforms were led by government, but paid by donors. And of course, this is, you know, relevant to a lot of ongoing discussions about local ownership and aid. Um, and I wonder if there are lessons there or points there to highlight for other countries um, about relationships between uh, local governments and, and, and donors. Yes, well, I think I should clarify one thing that when I say that uh, uh, policies were led by government, actually, I think it was a strong engagement because often policies were actually led by donors. Let's be, let's be frank about that. And in a way, uh, government reacted usually positively. Partly there was no choice. I mean, if you want money, you have to listen. And, but what seems to be the case is that Bangladesh actually proved to be a good, good student of the new liberal uh, paradigm. And, and uh, despite all the things that we say about new liberalism and how badly it can affect the country, uh, fortunately or unfortunately, uh, these policies actually uh, helped Bangladesh. For example, you know, structural adjustment and trade liberalization. Uh, this actually helped Bangladesh, actually. But, you know, even if you talk about agriculture and the Green Revolution, uh, there's a lot of initial work that had to be done preceding these policy changes. But once the, that the basic institutions and infrastructure was in place, technology was in place, uh, trade liberalization, privatization of trade in food and so on. So this played a very, very significant role in uh, further catalyzing Bangladesh's agricultural performance. <clears throat> so in a way, I, what I usually say is the neoliberal uh, policies handed down by donors, accepted willingly, unwillingly, semi-willingly, whatever, actually, Proved to be fruitful, right? I think it was, in fact, a great lesson to learn. Uh, not, there are problems. I mean, I have talked about inequality. Inequality is obviously a problem. But then, you know, I mean, uh, that's something that can perhaps be addressed in other ways. So there are trade offs. But the process of growth, the process of even uh, widely shared growth, all this uh, was enabled by this close engagement between donors the government, and as I said, the other important sectors of the economy, including the private sector. Thanks very much. Um, we're almost, we're just about out of time, but I wonder if Darlene would like to have a final comment? Yes, I wanted to ask, uh, I don't know if it's a comment, but I think it's a question for Murshid. Um, um, when you look at the, the, the donor community in um, Bangladesh, 
were there more traditional donors supporting the development of Bangladesh or were these the non-traditional uh, donors supporting um, the development of Bangladesh? So I would like you to just comment on who gave you think, who was probably the, the maybe the best uh, donor, if that makes sense. So uh, to see the differences yeah, of what yeah, was. Yeah. Um, yes, let me, <laughs> okay, let me kind of try and refresh my memory. I think the biggest bilateral donor has been and remains Japan. Okay. And, and, uh, and the, the largest bi uh, multilateral donors are the World Bank and the Asian Development Bank. But the important role was played also by the UK DFID mm -hmm. and also the Scandinavians. So actually everybody pitched in. And, and they had their own little, you know, jurisdictions and sectors that, you know, they, they would guard very closely. <laughs> but, uh, so everybody was there, but I think these were, these were basically the major ones. And, and their practices varied. The Scandinavians were usually better uh, in terms of the terms and conditionalities. But over the years, I, I think the conditionality regime and the strings and so on, these changed, these improved, you know, even the World Bank and ADB you see quite dramatic shifts in the way they handle these things. And, but in, when we were in the thick of it in the 80s and 90s, it was often very, very contentious and highly controversial. But over the long run, on average, it seemed to have worked out. Thanks very much. Unfortunately, we need to close the, the seminar there. Um, I have to keep it on time, uh, but I you know, thank you very much for, for your presentations and your questions today. And I think we could keep going with many more questions for you. Uh, we were talking in um, among us before the, before the seminar about how the Bangladesh story hasn't received as much attention um, as, it, as it should. And so hopefully um, we've sort of given it a bit more attention and I hope that uh, you'll all read uh, Dr. Murshid's book, which is coming out next next month, uh, and we can continue these discussions. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much.